Welcome back, everybody. Good to see your faces. Uh, thanks for joining us for our weekly edition of the Beit Midrash, or what are the Hasidic rabbis thinking? I don't know. We'll find out today. Uh, we'll explore more today. Um, glad y'all are here. Glad you're joining us. I really should come up with some kind of jingle or something for this. So, you know, when we walk, when we tune in, like, do 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 do. Um, and we'll come, we'll work on that. But uh, in the meantime, uh, glad you're here to join and to learn with us today. We're going to do something slightly different. We're going to take uh, three snippets from three Hasidic rabbis, including uh, one of my favorite Hasidic teachings of all time, um, at least in the top five or so. Um, and so we're going on all on Parshat Truma. Uh, or relating to Parshat Truma, and really specifically on one verse that we're going to look at. Um, so we'll start with uh, Reb Levi Yitzchak of Berdachev, the uh, Kedushat Levi. If somebody wants to read his teaching, which is less his teaching and more on the Al Sheikh, but you know we're not gonna we're, we're not gonna split hairs here. Um, if somebody wants to begin by reading for us. I'll start that. Um, we know what Rabbi Moshe Alsh, Alshich, um, Alshi of Turkey, Israel, wrote on the verse, make me a sanctuary and I will dwell among them. That Israel did not think that the Holy Blessed One would dwell in the temple alone, but the purpose was that God's presence would dwell among Israel. Thus, that is said, make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell among them, implies I will dwell among Israel and not in the temple alone. Okay. So let's kind of start on the verse that the, that uh, both Reb Levi Yitzchak and uh, the al Sheikh are drashing on. What So what stands out to you on this verse? Make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell among them. Well, it's interesting. It doesn't say, make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell among you. That's the first thing that comes out. Among, it doesn't say you. What else does it not say? It also doesn't say that he's going to dwell in a sanctuary. Good. You know, in ancient times, the temple or a sanctuary or something like that was imagined to be the house in which the God dwelled. So um, on some level, you know, the Greeks understood that, you know, the, the house of the gods was on Mount Olympus, but that if you, but that if you, sac that particular altars would bring the God to that altar to, as a way of uh, summoning them, so to speak. On some level, you're, building this house for God, the sanctuary, this Mishkan for God, but it doesn't say that God's going to dwell in the sanctuary. It doesn't say, make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell with, um, within it. It says, I will dwell among them, among the Israelites. Well, nor does it say to me that the sanctuary is necessarily a building. I mean, is it, I mean, is it implied or assumed? What else would it be? Well, just a place whereby the Jews' behavior, that they invite um, like the spiritual being and the spirituality into their community. Okay, so now you're thinking like a Rebbe, but um, <laughs> we'll circle back to that a little later. Okay. But um, if you read the Torah portion, what happens that God, that God tells Moses to tell the people to collect all this materials so that they can build the sanctuary. So, and then they go and God then starts giving the instruction manual for how to build said sanctuary and what it's supposed to look like and what's supposed to be in it, what vessels does it need, how long are the beams supposed to be, and how what are the 
like the covering of it. So I, it seems from the description in the Torah that it is talking about a building. But we're going to circle back to that idea a little later. Um, so the way that Reb Levi, how is Reb Levi Yitzchak reading this interpretation then? Uh, make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell among them implies I will dwell among Israel and not in the temple alone. What does that mean? That's like a quid pro quo. If, if you do this for me, then I will I will dwell among Israel. If you build if you build this for me, then I will be with you. Okay, yes, I think that's part of it. I think some of what they're imagining too is kind of taking the theme, taking kind of a royalty theme here, is that a good king or queen does not just live in the castle and never come out. So on some level, the king or queen needs to come out of the castle and dwell among, like, know the people, see the people, come to the people on occasion. And I feel like on some level, that's a little bit of what this is that, yes, you're building for me the sanctuary, but I will dwell among all of you. Like, not just in the temple, but also among the people um, as well. So that I will be both, it, I will be both there and amongst all of you. Questions, comments, thoughts? Do you know, it was interesting that uh, God was so specific about what the sanctuary should look like, even though he would not be there all the time. So going back to what Cindy said, that any place that there were people who believed in one God, that's where God was. Yes. So th this opens up a little bit of the question too, is taking the Mishkan less specifically, taking this struck the Torah's ideal structure less as a unique thing, but more generally, what is the purpose of a sanctuary, a temple, a synagogue? Is it for God? Is it supposed to be Bethel? Is it supposed to be a house of God? Or is it something else? It's also really interesting that I was thinking about it. It doesn't say... I'll dwell among them as long as the sanctuary stands. It says, if you build it, I will dwell among them. And that almost gives you an opening for God's presence to endure, even if the sanctuary doesn't. If you build it, I will come. Um, you don't have to maintain it, but if you build it. <laughs> um, if you build it, I will come. It doesn't sound as good if I'm not James Earl Jones. Um Yes, it kind of does seem to, it doesn't say anything about maintain maintenance. It says, if you build it, I will dwell among you. Um, I saw something recently, um, I'm trying to remember where I saw it, where it kind of ties, it tries to connect a little bit with, oh, maybe it's, I think, actually with the Haftar for today. It ties a little bit with Solomon, where with Solomon, when Solomon actually builds the temple, which is a more permanent form of the Mishkan, because the Mishkan, they're still in the wilderness. They need to be able to tear it down and bring it with them to the next stop. Um, that God kind of says, if you build it, I will come and I will be there as long as you are faithful to the covenant. If you're not faithful to the covenant, then less so. Um, and I think that's, so yes, it doesn't really make this specification here, but it seems to be an amendment that comes in later. Um, with that. 
other comments, questions, thoughts? Well, let you guys ponder this question of what is the actual purpose of a synagogue sanctuary, uh, whatnot. But um, it's an interesting question to think about. I forgot. I forgot the question, Rabbi. I'll give that one a shot. I think it's for the people of the community to gather together in a holy space. Okay. So, I, look, I, look, here's the here's the deal: is that it's not an act. There's not like a yes or no answer. Is that is it for God? Yes. Is it for people? Is it for the community? Yes. Um, I agree with you. I think that on some level, that the point of a building is for the people to be able to direct their attention spiritually in that space because if we assume that God is everywhere then what's special about this space well it's not special to God but it's special to us as a way of being able to direct our attention in that moment and in that space while we are there towards the spiritual towards the divine towards god and be able to focus our attentions more easily but you know there's nothing holy or sacred about 2179 highland avenue south in and of itself right like the specific location of temple bethel is not holy in and of itself. What makes it holy is the fact that we have designated it and separated it as holy as a place to be able to gather as a community. Um, we won't go too far down this rabbit hole. I think it's another conversation of what defines sanctity, what defines holiness, what makes something holy or not. Um, but it's a worth pondering and contemplating along the line. Um, we're going to move on to the next one. Um, Rabbi Nathan Sternhartz of Nemedov. Um, as you re might recall um, from our conversation with uh, Breslov when we talked about Rabbi Nachman um, a few weeks ago, Reslov is somewhat unique in that um, after Rebbe Nachman's death, there was no successor. Um, his only child had died before him, and there was no one else to step up. So they maintained themselves by largely by the work of Re uh, Reb Natan, uh, Rabbi Nathan Starnhertz, who kind of picked up and continued teaching according to one of Rebbe Nachman's students who kept teaching what Rebbe Nachman would have taught and kept kind of expanding Rebbe Nachman's teachings and thought along here. Um, in this particular book, uh, Likutei Halachot, what he tries to do is he tries to take, um, he tries to interpret the Shulchan Aruch, which is one of the primary law codes um, in Jewish history. Um, not the only one, but kind of the uh, the more the currently the more authoritative one. Um, and he tried to interpret the Shulchan Aruch through Rabbi Nachman's teachings and tried to explain how the Halakha how Rabbi Nachman's teachings fall in line with the Halakha. Um, you know, somebody want to read. Uh, that Natan had to teach. I'll read it. Can you hear me? Okay. God therefore commanded the Israelites regarding the work of the Mishkan, the portable sanctuary the Israelites used to pray in the wilderness during their journey from Egypt to Israel, that each person should bring a donation of the heart for its construction because the good that was in each person awoke. Each person, according to the good that they have, brought a donation of the heart for the building of the Mishkan. Because the Mishkan was built from all the good that came out of, is, out of each Israelite, 
which is gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and crimson yarn, Exodus 25, three to four, meaning that each person brought according to the good point within them. Great. Um, if you remember when we learned Rebbe Nachman a few weeks ago, Rebbe Nachman's, one of Rebbe Nachman's arguments, at least the one that we learned, was that you know the bad things in the world are not necessarily bad, but there's they're necessarily good. We just can't see the good within it, um, which is somewhat theologically problematic. But in, um, that was kind of his position: was that there's good within everything, including within each person. So what's his kind of argument? What's he arguing here? Well, he's actually saying that um, that the gifts that are brought are actually the good points from within each individual person. And this is um, what's, I guess, from the heart. You know, you have to, I, my original um, rabbi was actually a Breslov, uh, I guess it, he was a Balshuva in, in Mir, Mir Shavim, and he came from um, England and, and was one of the um, actual translators of the Ramkal. But he really always stressed to me that even when I was frustrated, he would say, look for the good point look for the good point, look for the good point in that person, which is not always easy when they're beating up on you, but you still got to look for the good point. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very Breslov attitude. Um, yeah, so there's a couple different things going on here is that um, each of us has a good point within us. Each of us has something special, holy. Each of us has a special gift that we can contribute. But I think there's an important point here as well in that, what does he say? Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, crimson. These are all these are more metaphorical gifts. Each of them is, each of them is a different, and each of us has something different we can contribute. However, in the big scheme of the Mishkan, you need the blue yarn just as much as you need the gold. Um, because you can't finish the construction. If you just had a bunch of gold, you wouldn't actually be able to follow all of God's directions for the Mishkan. So on some level, there's an argument here that everybody has a different gift that they can offer to the community. Everybody has something, has a spiritual good that they can contribute. And all of those gifts are equally valuable. Okay, I have a comment, Please. and uh, you guys are on it. So I'm thinking, you know, it kind of reminds me of um, the breastplate that the high priest has in his garments, and these colors are included in that. And um, it's kind of like, the gold is is a conim and the silver is a lazy. I mean, it's just like it's speaking to me in, in different ways. So but I know that this is a, a, a really um, educated group regarding Torah. So that was just one of my thoughts. It's an interesting thought. Um, I think what I'm trying to redirect towards is that 
if you read it that way, that gold is the Kohanim and silver is the Levi and bronze is the Israel, um, yes, I, there are those arguments, but what I'm trying to read direct towards is that each of us has something to contribute to the larger community. And you ultimately need all of them. So that if you start putting them into a hierarchy of or prioritizing, then that minimizes the gifts of other people. Does that make I, sense? Yeah, I think it's interesting that um, like when the Israelites were to bring sacrifices, um, to the temple that um, it, there, there were specifics about, you know, you know, bring one cow and three this and whatever without blemish, you know, a lot of rules, right? And to participate in the building of the Mishkan, everybody brought a little something. There, there wasn't a, a I mean, uh, unless there is something in, in, the, in the Torah that I, you know, certainly you know that I don't know or don't remember. But, um, but from what I'm reading here is like, you know, everybody bring a little something, bring the special part of yourself and we will build this holy place rather than, you know, specifics. And that, so that everybody could participate on their own level. And there was, you know, even if you didn't have like the perfect cow, you could still participate in the building of the Mishkan. So a couple different things with that. Um, one, yes, so part of the idea of the Mishkan here is that Moses kind of says to the people, bring whatever you bring whatever's in your heart to bring. Here's a list of things that we need, but you donate according to what you need. And the Israelites bring it. Um, at some point, Moses actually has to tell them to stop because they have enough and they can't, like, they're, they're getting to excess with their donations. May that ever happen in any nonprofit organization? Um, we have to tell, you know, we have enough money. I think we're okay. You don't need to donate anymore. Um, I don't see that happening. Uh, <laughs> but it's a pretty impressive thought. Um, what you're referring to, though, is a little later with the sacrifices. And the sacrifices are a little different. Um, however, with certain sacrifices, there is actually a sliding scale. And the Torah does actually say, if you cannot afford this, here is an alternative sacrifice you can bring. Um, which in and of itself is kind of an amazing statement of its you know considering the time like that's a pretty uh, impressive statement that you know this is just as good if you can't afford this and that's okay um but i think where this is trying to go is that and i think what rabbi rabbi, rabbi Nathan is trying to teach here is that Everybody has, everybody can contribute something to the community and the community needs all of the gifts that everybody can contribute. And none are really more valuable or holier than the other. Um, you know, we, I've done this exercise with teenagers before about around Sadaka. is that, you know, who, who gives a more valuable Sadaka gift? Is it the millionaire who has $10 million of disposable income and just kind of says, okay, I'll donate 2 million here, 2 million here, 2 million here, and calls it a day? Or is it the woman, you know, the school teacher who has $100 of disposable income and donates it all to the charity that she really finds important? Or is it the person who really doesn't have any disposable income but volunteers their time to be able to help the community in a way that they feel strongly about? Um, This is another one. I'm not sure you can actually make a the right answer of who is the most valuable, but each of them is giving in a way that 
that makes a meaningful difference to the community and the community needs all of it. Questions, comments? We'll look at one more, which is one that I always love. Which is Or Hameir, Rev Zev Wolf of Jitamir. We have looked at him before. Um, if somebody wants to read him, all right. Please. Uh, always, we should be building up our entire selves from head to foot to be dwelling places for the divine. That is why in the wilderness they built the Mishkan from donations that are mentioned in the Torah. And thus, in every generation, we still have not stopped from this. We, the people of Israel, are called upon to always build the form of God's presence within our own selves. Our rabbis taught the verse, build for me a sanctuary, and I will dwell among them. Uh, Exodus 25, 8, in it. The sanctuary is not stated, but rather among them the people. This teaches that the holy blessing, one dwells in every member of Israel, and that is why we have taught that when we build ourselves up to be dwelling places for the, ble for the blessing God, then the blessing one will dwell within us. What's, so what's the Or Meir's argument? That that we're supposed to, I guess, build ourselves up spiritually so that God's presence can reside within us. Um, we are the Mishkan, in, in a yeah. sense. And um, so we have to build ourselves up spiritually so that God is willing to dwell within us, to make it the kind of place for God to dwell. Beautiful. So when it... When God tells us to build the Mishkan, the Mishkan is merely symbolic. Um, really, we're supposed to build ourselves into a Mishkan. We're supposed to make ourselves into a sanctuary in which God can dwell. Um, questions, comments, thoughts before I expand on this a little bit. But. So how do we kind of weave these teachings together? Like, why did I bring in all three of these? Um, I could have just brought in one. It would have been just as good. Um, I think there's a little bit of this in which we are, while we are instructed to turn ourselves into be the Mishkan ourselves, to be a place in which God dwells, um, you know, the Gedusha Levi introduces the idea that the Mishkan is not the essential part. The building is not the essential part. It's a, that God dwells among us. And with the Or Meir, it's like, yes, God dwells among us because we are the sanctuary in the first place. We are the Mishkan. So how do we make ourselves into a Mishkan? We, we both contribute our own special gifts. We give our own special spiritual gifts that we have, that we can give back to the community, but also we accept the gifts that others bring as well. We accept everybody else as part of the community and that the gifts that they, each of them can share also. And in that way, when we're, when there's, when we're both giving of ourselves, but also learning and accepting from other people, that's when we can actually build ourselves into a place in which God can dwell. Questions, comments, thoughts, musings.
So is building oneself up, is that, I'm just, I'm thinking from, uh, is that a part of like doing the mitzvot, the misvotes and, and, and Sadaka and all that kind of stuff? Is that the stuff that helps to build us up spiritually or just being a Mitch? I, I don't know. The two are not mutually exclusive. Um, <laughs> yes, I think I think part of it is how do you build yourself spiritually into a place in which God can dwell? Um, there's a famous conversation um, with the Kotzker Rebbe, where the Kotzker asked his students, um, you know, where does God live? Or where does God dwell? And the students looked at him like, what do you mean, where does God dwell? You know, God dwell, you know, God's everywhere. God's in everything. Like, what do you mean, where does God dwell? God's everywhere. And the Kutzker responds, God dwell, dwelled wherever you let him in. So some of it is having the openness and the willingness to accept the possibility of, of God in your life. And there, once you have that opening, then you can start with building everything else up. You need to start with a possibility, with the, with the choice to do it. Um, and then you can start working on mitzvot and being a mensch and building yourself spiritually. But if you don't, if the doors are closed, to the Mishkan, then God can't get in either. I also kind of, you know, thinking about it, I also kind of want to say that I think spiritually building ourselves up probably looks different for each of us as well. I'm not sure there's one construction pattern that works for everybody. Um, I think there is, just as we each have different gifts, I think each of us would build ourselves up spiritually in a slightly different way. But yes, the covenant, the meets vote, are kind of a foundation on for building that. And I think all of the Rebbe's would would jump in on that as a as a basic principle as well. Other questions, comments, thoughts? I think that us studying together in any situation helps us build ourselves up by hearing what others have to say and how they act and what they are. Yeah, um, you know, Tom, you know, Tammy had asked about mitzvot. Well, yes, Talmud Torah is a mitzvah also. So learning together um, and expanding your knowledge is a possibility. Um, and you still need to be willing to actually learn and accept and listen to other people also, yes. That's what we're doing. Yes, uh, agreed. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think we've all been in classes where somebody who walks, walks in saying, I know all the answers and I don't really need to pay attention to anybody else. You know, just showing up is not enough. But being open to willing to listen, to hear, to learn together, to understand and view other viewpoints, I think I think that's part of how you can spiritually grow and build yourself up too. Not disagreeing with you, just building on what you said. 
I totally agree. And um, what Mick, Nikki said is so true because, you know, I've only been in this class a few times, but I think I really love this group. I mean, I love the personalities. I love the diversity. I love just the fact that people can share and and just I learn so much from everyone and I feel connected. So for me, it's a true blessing to, to just be a part and to be here and to listen. And I think if I didn't have this or if it went away, I'd be deeply sad. Well, we're glad you're here too, Shirley. Thank you. And we appreciate your contributions as well. Well, I'm learning. <laughs> Um, you know, one of my favorite Mishnayot in uh, Pure Kei Avot is, uh, or at least a snippet part of the Mishnah, is Ben Zoma says, who is wise, one who learns from everybody. Um, you know, you, you, you learn, when you can learn from everybody, that's when you can really learn a lot. If you think you know it already, you're not going get, to get very far. Other questions, comments, thoughts? I've got a question. So um, we're studying these thoughts on tour from 300 years ago. 300 years from now, who are people going to be reading to see how we thought and like people's ideas on that? Excellent question. I mean, uh, I can tell you who I who I hope people are reading. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll preface it by saying that a little bit of the idea of the rabbinic movement and rabbinic thought is that you're always building on top of what other people have started. So. On some level, I'm hoping in 300 years, they're still reading the Or HaMeir, um, they're still reading Kedushat Levi, they're still reading Rebbe Nachman, they're still reading the Talmud, they're still reading the Mishnah. God willing, they're still reading the Torah because, you know, I've well, got to start somewhere. Um, but who are the modern people that people will be learning from? Um, The people I hope that people 300 years from now are still reading. Um, I would say, you know, I, I'm a little biased. I, all of this is my opinion, so I'm biased on all of them. Uh, I'd say Rabbi Brad Artson, um, I'm hoping people are still reading his work then. Um, I will say um, I, Rabbi Shai Held, I think, has some really profound insights into how, into what the Torah is saying. And I imagine Rabbi Jonathan Sachs is going, might still be getting read in 300 years. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Um, Yossi Klein Halevi, I think, would be a good one for people to keep learning from. Um, Rabbi David Hartman, um, he was a fascinating guy himself. Um, I'll throw in my Rebbe, Reb Mibi Feigelson, who I don't think she has a dissertation. I don't know if she's actually published like a book. I don't think she has, but um, she really does a lot in terms of taking spirituality and turning it into what do you do with it now? Um, though her dissertations on you know the transition from the life of the world of the living to the world of the of the into the next world and about 
rabbinic ideas of that transition. Um, but those are some. I'm sure there's plenty of people I'm not mentioning. Um, That's a long list. That's something to start with. <clears throat> if any, if even a couple of them are still being read, I think it'll be okay. <laughs> Interesting question. Um, there are a lot of people doing some really great things out there. Um, so. In, in addition to um, innovative thought like that, which I think that's where you're going to, I mean, there is that whole body of work, isn't there, that's sort of like, you know, in our modern legal system, like case law. I mean, in, in so we, is it just in conservative Judaism where we have, like, I guess it's like a bait dean that considers the changes and I mean, isn't that a, a like a, a, won't that be his, like a historical document, like sort of like a modern day um, Talmud, so to speak? Yeah. Um, yeah, like a lot of, some of the people that I mentioned do, discuss kind of the intersection of halakha and um, life and spirituality. Um, rabbi Aaron Alexander, um, he's the current, he's the co-senior rabbi at Addis Israel in Washington, DC. Um, he does a lot on the spirituality of halakha. Um, which is really, he has some really fascinating insights on it. Um, but yes, I think there's there's a lot of people who are go, who are working on the evolution and the next evolution of halakha and of Jewish law, and who are trying to tackle cases as they come and that it's an important part of the halakha of halakha in itself is the idea of chuvot which are answer papers um and the committee on jewish law committee of jewish law and standards of the conservative movement does you know you public access you can go to any of them online and read them um there's some really interesting ones on there some of them are kind of dense but <laughs> Um, you know, I think there's like a 120 page one on lab grown meat and whether lab grown meat should be considered parv or fleischig, um, basadi in Hebrew. Um, but you know. I think part of it is, yes, we're going to, I don't know who in 300 years, I don't know who's going to be the next step in those evolutions yet and dealing with those case laws, but I think it's, we need those rabbis dealing with those as well. Um, and trying to say, how can, how can, uh, you know, our tradition of thousands of years, what does it have to say about you know, the modern problems of today and how can we apply the past to the present. That's what keeps this a living tradition. I think that answered your question, but if it didn't, Cindy, let me know. Anybody else? Well, kola kavod, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to learn together. Um, looking forward to continuing uh, next week. And uh, as always, if, if I'll see you on Shabbat, uh, 
I'll see you on Shabbat. Look forward to seeing you on Shabbat. If I don't, then I'll say Shabbat Shalom a little bit early. Uh, if I'm not going to see you between now and next week, have a good week. Thank you, everybody. Take care, everybody. Well. Be well. Thanks Thank for coming. Take care. Thank you.